okay, great. Thank you, uh, Kate and everybody um, for the opportunity to speak to you today and also for the McGinnis Fellowship in general and all of your efforts here to um, give me such a warm uh, welcome. It's been wonderful being here and getting to reflect on both the work that I'm doing, but also the work that all of you are doing in addressing um, these important questions facing the planet and how you're all playing your, your, own, your own unique uh, lenses to do so. So I'm very grateful to be part of that conversation. Um, uh, I'm gonna just give you a little bit of context before I begin. And I appreciate that today we have two, a two-part approach. Uh, first, a public workshop, including the Zoom, um, people in Zoom land, uh, and then also a, a more focused workshop afterwards. Um, and they're both around the questions of inter disciplinary research and what that means, um, what it means and how we should actually do it and when should we do it. Um, and as you all know, I've also spoken a lot about in my own work in my Maganya talk, uh, the role of thermostatic institutions as my latest way to think about a hook to organize knowledge around how do we uh, try and think about intervening in ways to address actual very clear problems that have very clear objectives in mind. And of course, the climate crisis is one of one of the, those that has that. Um, but uh, for this lecture, I want to uh, uh, sort of deep dive further then into the questions of uh, interdisciplinary policy analysis, interdisciplinary studies and policy analysis. How would you actually conduct and apply policy analysis uh, to address these problems that uh, we're facing? And I'm going to um, then argue, it'd be very provocative. I told somebody the other day I was going to be provocative, and they said, Ben, you're always provocative, but I'm going to be provocative uh, and, and argue that um, uh, this data-driven world we live in has largely undermined an ability to ameliorate environmental challenges. Okay, That's my overall argument, which is very, very provocative, right? The data-driven metaphor has undermined our ability to address uh, these problems, but I'm going to actually show you that by showing you how doing um, a, a path dependency analysis, which does not begin with a data-driven metaphorical orientation, does hold promise. So I'm gonna actually give it to you in a very positive way versus necessarily a negative way. But I wanna begin with a little story, which I just love. So, um, you know, I, as, you'll, as you know, I engage with a lot of uh, academics who apply a range of different methods, quantitative and qualitative. And to me, that's the only way to go to Think about the policy problems facing the world. Um, but I do specialize myself in largely uh, comparative, qualitative, and historical analysis, my own, my own niche, my own contribution to these broader community questions. And over the last 25 years, I've, years, I've noticed that actually qualitative methods have been given less and less attention, and even the humanities themselves, less and less attention, not just the social sciences. And even at Yale, which was known historically for being sort of humanities, social science, uh, uh, you know, deeply philosophical, and then kind of up from that, you get a broader base. Even Yale's gone in a more data-driven world, uh, such, a, such that the new policy school has been justified by collecting data-driven answers to the questions we face. Okay, so over time, the, my contribution, you know, which I see as you know, part of a broader community, has become uh, more, more and more marginalized, if you, if you will, okay, in the academic world. Uh, and so I've been kind of curious about that, you know, for a variety of reasons. One, just personally, it's kind of frustrating. But two, you wonder if it actually matters and say, why are we having this shift? What's going on here? And so I was at this talk and uh, somebody was talking about deforestation, a question that I, I work on a lot, as Kate mentioned. And the person said, we have to have uh, data on the levels of deforestation that are taking place in different countries. So we have to have very clear data on all of this because um, uh, uh, that would give us the answer as to uh, um, uh, whether and how we can address the deforestation crisis. And then he went further and he said, um, and um, governments listen to uh, data. They, they need to see this very clear quantitative data in order to respond to policy problems which I thought was interesting because I hadn't really heard that before. Because the hypothesis was that you need to have large-end data to influence policymaking. 
And I thought it was, it was a bit more complicated that actually all kinds of data and knowledge and information might shape policy responses. So I put up my hand and I said to him, okay, so I see your point about quantitative data being important as part of the broader story, but you're saying that actually you need it to influence policy choices. He says, he says yes. So your hypothesis, your hypothesis is a causal one that the more quantitative data you have, the more you will actually shape policy outcomes. But I thought it was kind of funny given the climate crisis, a lot of da quantitative data on that right now, and it hasn't done much yet to shape the policy responses. So I asked the guy, I said, do you, ha do you have any data on that hypothesis? <laughs> Which I thought was very clever on my part actually, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the answer was no, okay? So you go one step up and it's a causal myth. But even those advancing quantitative analysis is being better than other methods are actually themselves advancing causal myths themselves. So what level are you operating at to me? That is kind of a metaphorical point for this, this talk, okay? Yeah, um, so uh, there you go. That's, that's my story, it makes, makes me look so good. <laughs> okay, so um, but there's really three questions here then. Where is the evidence then for evidence-based approaches? Because data-driven has, has coincided with this term evidence-based. And I've thought a lot about that this turn towards evidence-based metaphors as well, which apparently comes from actually the medical uh, sector, the healthcare sector, which I think that makes sense. You do need to have evidence about how people are getting affected by diseases like COVID before you can manage them. But I thought, why is it emerging in our world? Because after all, one hypothesis is that before the evidence-based metaphor came in, we didn't look at evidence, right? We just made things up. Right, you know, and I thought it's kind of funny because I thought I was doing research in the field, talking to people, doing interviews, and I thought I was talking to environmentalists and logging companies, but apparently I hadn't been doing evidence-based work before, right? So, oh, and I realized, oh, evidence-based is a certain kind of evidence, okay? So that also got me curious about then what is the evidence for evidence-based research and where's the data for data-driven analysis? And I actually don't see it. I don't see um, any answers to that. I don't, it's just a causal myth, in my opinion, okay? So then, um, but I want to think about then, how does that then, in my talk, how does that then shape how we see climate change? How does that affect actual problems, these causal myths that aren't based on data or evidence? Um, yes, and I do have an article in the works called, an article in the works that has this title, this first question, where are the data? data driven, where's the evidence for evidence-based? Okay, but more importantly, how does it shape the, uh, how we see climate change? And then, what does this mean? What are the implications then for applied policy analysis? So I'm hoping that my talk then will be able, when I, when I finish my talk, these three questions I think will be answerable, okay, in some way. Uh, at least we'll begin the conversation to answer these and we can continue, continue in the workshop too and, and, and in the Q&A as well. Um, so that's my argument then, okay, that um, a, a data-driven world has undermined an ability to solve the climate crisis. Uh, in part because it turns to lessons from the past to generate what are elusive universal understandings of the social world. So it turns to lessons from the past to generate elusive universal understandings of the social uh, world. It means we ask questions like, what are human beings willing to pay? And then if we can find out what they're willing to pay for the climate crisis, we can just determine whether or not it's rational to achieve a 1.5 degree world or a 3.2 degree world or a five degree world. Um, or we ask, what's the political feasibility of this right, to do something? And if, and if it's not politically feasible, we can't do it. Um, but behind these projects are, are universalism projects that assume that these are fixed variables. And the reason why that's important is that these are not fixed. These change over time. But the very methods we apply to answering these questions can't tell us how they actually change over time. It's a different set of methods. I love the example of, a, of even elections. Okay, elections are great because pollsters are very good at describing, um, well, not always good, but sometimes good at describing what will happen, right? But they're confusing their descriptive abilities is to say what's happening with their predictive abilities. So when Hillary Clinton lost the election, the pollsters predicted she would win. But of course, the explanation for her not winning was owing to a typewriter that James Comey found, which you can't know about in a poll. It's the, it's the wrong place to look for these external variables. And so it gives us false sense of security that you can predict when you're just describing. And how does this work? 
the closer you get from description to the actual event, the more you think you can predict. But that's tautological. That's just because you're almost the level of the same thing. And the further away you are, the more you cannot uh, predict, right? So when you search there for universal generalize generalizable um, patterns, you are falling into a trap of actually producing a historical work if you're trying to predict from that. If you're sticking at description, totally fine. You're part of a really good project to understand then how things change over time, of which you will add to, but can't fully yourself uh, complete, right? But if you think you can predict from your work and you don't need to talk to other anthropologists or historians, you're actually undermining the ability to actually act adequately. Uh, Bill, I like this one. And what are the drivers of deforestation? I love that one. But you can just get the answer. What are the drivers? Do the data-driven analysis and you've got the answer and then you can tell policymakers, oh, I've discovered the answers to, to deforestation, right? By the way, the answer is um, capitalism. There you go, okay. Now, what do we do with that, right? I could have told you that before we did a lot of research, right? So this leads us into then um, cost-benefit analysis emerging as a great way to handle these questions, right? And of course, it's very sophisticated. The methods involved in cost-benefit analysis are so sophisticated uh, that almost nobody else involved in that community can really understand it, okay? So that causes a problem because those in that community can't understand anybody else so you better not talk to them, that's just gonna undermine your project. But then likewise, you can't then connect the dots for the very knowledge you need to actually solve these problems. It's very ironic. Uh, I would even argue that multi-goal policy analysis is the same thing, you know, balancing different goals, finding some systematic way to behave has the same problem, even if it's even broader and has more lenses inside of it. Uh, so, and this is again, all the quest for what are the rational answers to, um, to perceive, okay? So um, uh, what I want to argue then is that we need to think about policy analysis as a way to change underlying patterns, not accept them, change them. That's got to be the beginning of policy analysis. How do we change, not accept? Um, so there's an explanatory, but also a prescriptive dimension to um, my argument, right? Um, so of course, data-driven whatever is totally important. In fact, the climate crisis comes to us from data driven scientists who tell us we're in trouble. Um, but the way it's being applied, the way it's limited interdisciplinary thinking has undermined an ability to, gener to generate analysis that would change future, that would change future evidence. Okay, how do we change future evidence? And I'm gonna give you some examples of that in my talk. Uh, and therefore to do this, to change future evidence, not accept current evidence and undermine um, the future, we need to bring back in conceptual, theoretical, and deliberative knowledge generation. People say to me, oh, Ben, you're just too theoretical. I'm like, well, what do you, I mean, to actually think about the problems we're facing, you need to have be theoretical. Like they, th they think theory is, is an opposition to actually the real world, right? You know, and I would argue just the opposite. The real world requires theorizing, theorizing what you're actually seeing to be effective. And I'm gonna, I think, show that in this talk. Uh, if that is, and, and again, this is if scholars want to contribute to rather than exacerbate critical problems such as climate change. Um, uh, and of course, you know these charts, right? Um, we've lived in this data-driven evidence-based world for a long time and great. So as you know, then um, what um, I've argued for a while now with my colleagues, Bernstein, Levin, and Ald, is that climate change and others like it ought to be considered super wicked problems. And I gave this slide the other day in my talk when talking about thermostats as being an important part of this conversation. But today I wanna, I wanna zero in on then uh, the key aspects of super wicked problems to drive home the point about the need to think about conceptualization and deliberation to begin with that first before then bringing in knowledge sources from different kinds of uh, evidence and data, okay? So that's why I'm, I'm, sh I'm slowing down for this uh, 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 effort on super wicked problems um, by arguing that if we have to focus on the key features, not, not if, no, not arguing if, I'm arguing we have to focus on the key features of any problem uh, we seek to shed light on 
if we want to find a way not just to analyze it, but to actually solve it. Little aside, uh, Harvard has a climate cluster. They just hired, just hired somebody for a climate cluster. And they hired somebody who fit the cost benefit analysis community of the last 30 years um, because their interest appears to be more in just studying the climate crisis. It, but if you want to think about solving the climate crisis, which is, I think, the, really, the real important value added of interdisciplinary knowledge, you got to begin and end with the actual problem itself, not just as a topic, but a thing to actually intervene to address. So time is running out um, um, is uh, fundamental because this key feature means that there's a certain crisis to the problem you're facing uh, when it's too late to act. And that does distinguish a lot of kinds of policy analysis available to policymakers where you can experiment, Limbaugh mask muddling through approach, you can experiment the back and forth trial and error. No, in these cases, you can't even sometimes wait for the evidence to appear because it's too late, uh, let alone not even the best method. Even if it was the best method, it's too late to even to do that. There's no time. So you've got to theorize about causal impacts, not just measure them when time is running out. Um, second, and I think this is important, those seeking to end the problem are also causing them. You had an election this weekend in Australia. Turns out, uh, turns out that climate change played a role in this election, very impressive, right? Um, but Australia, per capita is one of the highest emitting countries in the world. I think you've got the silver medal, or maybe 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 it's the bronze medal now. But you're, you're terrible, okay? By the Canadians are equal with you, okay? I'm a Canadian, so like, you know, I, I get it, right? But here we are thinking this is great, but actually we're also causing the problem to our behavior. So how do we handle this tension about the battle being with, our, with ourselves is gonna matter for policy analysis and what you actually do. And then third, um, policies discount the future irrationally. In other words, the policies we actually um, say are great, whether it might, whether it might be a, a tax or some kind of legislation, or even this, the latest effort now is to um, the non-proliferation of coal is another, the latest example of something to do. But when you add these all up, they actually don't, are still, are not, still are not in line with the nature of the problem itself. Uh, and so we're not, we're not identifying policies that are consistent with the problem at hand, and we have this irrationality aspect to it. Um, and then and in many cases, there's no central authority, which and the climate crisis is, of course, a key example. My point here isn't that all problems have all, the, have all these features. My point is that whenever you think about doing interdisciplinary research around problems, you gotta start with interrogation of the key features of the problem itself, and then justify whatever it is you're doing on your research side on the basis of in some way informing uh, that problem. So that's then led uh, myself with Kelly Levin, Graham Alden, and Stephen Bernstein to then argue that path dependency analysis, not cost benefit analysis, was the most appropriate way to proceed to think about intervening to address the climate crisis. Okay, so the logic was uh, path dependency analysis um, is, is uh, um, more appropriate because it targets then this fact that we're actually always pushing off into the future, our choices, we're being irrational, and what, well, time is running out, right? So how do we do that? How do we actually attend to our long-term interests? Um, and we um, uh, talked about the need then to constrain our future collective selves, just the way human beings individually um, have for a long time intervened to actually try and shape their own behaviors individually. So the smoker, for example, will pay somebody to hide their cigarettes on Thursday after they just smoked a pack on Monday and they're all fine now. And then they're like, I don't wanna have cigarettes again, so I'll go um, uh, pay somebody. So when I give my craving, I can't have my cigarettes, right? Or our, our all collective addiction now to, um, uh, cell phones, right? So I'll say to, I'll say to, I'll say to my, uh, my son, Joseph, if I, if I um, check my cell phone messages in the next four hours, I owe you $100 and I'll send him the text and I'll turn it off, right? I've intervened to constrain my future self, right? Uh, and this happens, uh, uh, we all try and do these kinds of things, right? But we're saying this is a much 
bigger problem for the same kind of metaphor, but it's a collective governance problem. It isn't an individual problem. So how, how do we intervene with our policy choices to constrain our future collective selves as time goes on is in line with the key features of the problem itself, okay? And this means that critical junctures have to be thought about where you can intervene and produce some critical junctures in historical moment that then what you do that can withstand the short-term pressures to reverse it. And critical junctures are the stuff of historical knowledge generation, these special moments in time where something happens that aren't generalizable, but they do happen and they can be, I would argue, caused in some way. So where are the easiest critical junctures to unleash? Where are they? And then how would you then find the levers to maintain them? It to me is the key question facing super wicked problems. So now I'm not saying therefore that we shouldn't generate knowledge from all, all sources. I'm saying generate knowledge in ways that actually helps us find these easy to pull levers that are hard to reverse. Okay. Um, uh, and what we, did, what we did in our work was, I'm just gonna do this fast because I know my time's also running out. How much time do I have just roughly? Great, okay. Uh, so we did, what we did is we said, okay, look, most people working on the climate crisis um, had tended to try and do one big agreement um, all at once. Um, and like, uh, especially globally, right? Which is very hard to do given the nature of no central authority. And the result was lots of effort wasted on trying to do one big step solutions to the climate crisis when really, you want to think about multiple steps uh, for achieving these results. Some kind of moment where you do some trigger and then steps unfold. So we called, actually I called this with Michael Hallett actually, progressive, progressive incrementalism to distinguish from Lindblom's muddling through approach. People misunderstood us. They thought we meant still incrementalist as in like Lindblom, but we meant the opposite. We meant a number of steps to get to then uh, another equilibrium. We didn't necessarily mean like, over a long time, we said time is running out. We just meant multiple steps. So the label got us confused, but we simply meant if there's multiple steps, how do you do there? How do you get there? I'm gonna give you some examples shortly of actual empirical evidence-based multiple steps that have happened in the past based on um, critical um, juncture efforts that did in fact change the course of history. Um, and I want to argue that given they do exist empirically in the past, we could, create them into the future too. Um, so, but when I say pathways, multiple steps, we mean progressive incremental. We don't mean short, uh, small, or modest. Okay. So out of this, then we say, we can't actually have universal design principles that even Eleanor Ostrom uh, achieved. She had eight, I think. We say, no, you can't do that. There's just too many possibilities for uh, creating critical junctures. And designing for them. There's thousands of possibilities uh, and they each have their own logics to them that can only be determined by working backwards uh, with the knowledge, uh, different knowledge sources and thinking about the plausibility in that particular area to do something. Now, again, I'll give us some examples in a moment. And therefore we say, you gotta give up having answers and instead have diagnostic questions with which to generate interdisciplinary knowledge. So the first one is then, what can be done to create stickiness, making reversibility immediately difficult? That's the first question. That makes sense, right? Given the, feature, the features of certain problems. Uh, diagnostic question number two, what can be done to entrench support over time? That'd be very good, right? You're getting, gonna reverse on the effects of our, our desire to push off our goals. If you can design a way that we can't do that. Three, what can be done to expand the population that supports the policy? That'd be amazing because with no central authority, if you can find a lever that actually causes diffusion over time, you can you act in a way consistent with the key features of super wicked problems. And four, we added later, but we always meant it, it was implicit, but we added it more explicitly this time. How can policies be adopted consistent with a problem at hand? Because people are saying, oh, his path dependency, Ben. Here's a good example. I'm like, yeah, that's gonna get us to seven degrees Celsius. That's not a good example, right? So how do you think about then bringing the science into the actual problem itself, into the actual lever itself? Uh, okay, so I just gave you this chart that shows you then how we link these four questions to the different features. 
in these problems. And my argument is whenever you look at any problem now, and you're doing applied analysis to make a difference in the world, you have to do this. You have no choice but to begin and end with this kind of effort. And this is conceptual and deliberative, right? But you're linking then these questions to then the key features that then can allow for creative designs, many of which I would argue haven't even been thought of, let alone apply, applied because we've been locked in this data-driven evidence-based world that will give us the answer through machine learning and algorithms. Okay, so um, uh, how to do this? How to do this then path dependency? So long story short, there's a big literature on path dependency, especially among the qualitative historical folks um, uh, that has looked at um, historical examples, evidence-based examples of where path dependency, path dependency has actually worked or being applied. Now, in the English world, um, most of your, your typewriters, look at your typewriter, you have the QWERTY -E up in the top left corner there. Yeah, you see that in your computers? It's a very inefficient uh, way to lo locate your keyboard, turns out, very inefficient. Okay, so why hasn't it um, been reversed? Because after all, you know, we live in a global economy, economics dominates our thinking. Um, you want to have more efficient outcomes, so we should have that reverse to the more efficient keyboard. We don't. And the answer is policy lock-in. Okay, they get locked in uh, over time, uh, and there's some great work on this being done. But eventually, um, the story starts with the accidents made. You got the wrong keyboard too late. You train people how to type on a keyboard. All of a sudden, factories emerge to produce these keyboards. All of a sudden, more and more people get trained to type on these keyboards. All of a sudden, more and more factories produce these keyboards, and all of a sudden, the norm is locked in. This is how I type. And nobody wants to change. Okay, and you're locked in forever. Right? This happens. Uh, and but it's this is a metaphor for actually policy development. My colleague Jacob Hacker wrote a 500-page book showing why Hillary Clinton's um, plan to bring in universal health care to Americans in 1993 didn't work because the U.S. would be locked into a private system of healthcare owing to small little tax advantages in the 1930s being given to um, uh, companies to provide their workers with healthcare insurance. And then that led to the emergence of private healthcare insurance to fill that demand. That led to more and more workers demanding private healthcare insurance, which led to more and more companies providing it and more and more insurers coming in and then more and more lobbying to maintain that policy to maintain profits. And off you go, it was impossible. So he said she made a mistake. She didn't look at the key features of the problem at hand. Uh, and I'm gonna get to that in my examples in a second. He came, up, came, he came up with a very innovative solution to solving that problem based on this kind of approach. Okay, so then this shows then, but wow, this is complicated stuff, eh? There's four different mechanisms, uh, there's self-reinforcing aspects, increasing returns, positive feedbacks, holy cow, lots going on, but that's just the world we live in. There's nothing you can do about it. It just, we gotta unpack these causal processes we're looking at what, what, what explained the initial trigger and what explained the, the steps since then. And then for our world, you then got to then think about the plausible logics for designing this way into, into the future, okay? But you have no choice but to do that. And this helps us ponder this complexity in some way. So, uh, so one question then becomes, where do you find the levers? Where are they, right? Um, and the rest of the talk, I'm going to kind of skim through to give you the gist, but I'm giving you the gist to show you how this actually works in practice. This is deliberative, conceptual, it's empirical, it's evidence-based, but it's also got a lot of other stuff going on as well. So um, long story short, all this table does is it breaks down policy, policies not into um, one, but six different measures from the goals, the broad-based goals driving policy to objectives, uh, then to policy settings. And settings are the actual things that actually matter and they serve the objective's purpose, right? So for example, a speed limit would be a policy setting to achieve the objective of saving lives, right? In forestry, uh, a setting might be um, how many trees you harvest in a certain hectare to maintain biodiversity, okay? But the setting you have to know about because it actually gives the predictive ability to understand what's gonna happen on the ground. And then likewise, though, you've got policy means. What's the intervention logic overall? This tends to be around, you believe in market mechanisms, voluntary approaches and more command and control. 
Um, and then the tools are the things that actually you would draw on to actually accomplish something, a cap and trade system, a carbon tax, a regulation, right? The actual tools. And the calibrations are things like, well, how many police officers did you employ to enforce those speed limits? Did you use photo radar? All these kinds of things that are, wow, you change one thing in, this, in these cells and everything in the impacts changes. If you've got 10 police officers versus 1,000, everything else changes in its impacts, right? So it means that the possibilities of designing for policy are endless, are endless. And what, yeah, what do we do in, in the world and the environment? We say, does eco-labeling cause deforestation? It's an article that I, I wrote with two others, right? But we didn't look at the thousands of possibilities behind the ways in which uh, certification could have been designed. Each one would have had a different outcome on the impacts. We looked at the empirical evidence, right? So we looked at like two or three examples of thousands of possibilities. So the evidence is this, now we can act accordingly. It's impossible to run the experiment on what are thousands of possibilities, right? You gotta then think about the causal impacts of the design rather than wait for the evidence to come in. So that's why my way, my, my, my point though is that oftentimes a lot of the cool levers are on the calibration side. We're missing the calibration side when thinking more about objectives as being the, as being the levers. And I'm gonna show you some examples now where the levers are actually, um, down in the calibrations in the settings. And that's kind of interesting. Five? Five minutes. Okay. All right. It's a super good problem now. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to give some examples then. Of, uh, uh, or the final thing is then, when you're thinking about causal logics, you got to think about the policy impact, of course, on the ground, but also the way in which coalitions can emerge, not to accept feasibility, but to change, to change them. So I'm gonna just give you some examples given my time's ticking, but this is my, I'm gonna give you a, a non-climate case and then a climate case, and then we can go for Q and A. But I love the example of Obamacare. It comes in, what, 25 years after Hillary's failure. Uh, and by the way, my colleague Hacker, who showed why she made an error in her policy analysis, listening to cost benefit calculations. Um, he said, okay, the only answer is to fight fire with fire. Uh, path dependency caused private health care to dominate. Therefore, you must find a trigger to get public health care to dominate. He designed what was known as the public option. And that would simply allow Americans to, to opt into a public system if they wanted to or not. That sounds pretty benign, right? But it's ironic, but the public system is actually um, more efficient than the private system when it comes to health care. So over time, he theorized that you would get de facto universal health care over time. Okay, now the, the, the folks in the private in, insurance industry got a wind of this and they fought it tooth and nail. Uh, in the American system, um, 58 votes out of 100 is considered uh, less than, than um, 48 votes. And um, you, you needed 60 votes to break, to break your filibuster. And even though there's wide support in all houses, uh, it didn't pass for this reason. But instead, this did happen. A small little provision. In the policy setting side that nobody really knew about in, in a public uh, way, but people would support, um, was a little provision in this huge bill, little provision, and it said, those who are 26 and under, all Americans, uh, 26 and under, uh, must be covered by their parents' health care plan. Boom, that was it. Small little change like that. Laws passed. Okay, there was no demand for it. There was no, there was no social movement for it. There was no mobilization for it. Okay, but the theory was that once you do that, it's incredibly sticky because all of a sudden millions of Americans, young people are covered now. Their anxiety goes way down. They can change to better jobs and so on. Uh, and you're saving lives. Okay, so the reversibility is what would cause the mobilization. Can you imagine changing that law? You would have grandparents, parents, children in DC marching about and causing uh, political disruption to anybody who dared to do that. Now, I theorize that um, once this happened, I theorize that as a person, okay? Now, there's no, I had no evidence on that because in fact, you couldn't have the evidence until it was too late, right? But I theorize that. And so Trump gets elected and what does he say? Obamacare is terrible, except we're gonna keep this provision. Right, but you couldn't get the evidence for this story, and yet it impacted and saved 
thousands of lives, right? And we're missing these kinds of policy analysis techniques by um, not theorizing about um, policy design for future impacts. Okay, so I just want to go then go to the one other story that you guys know I talk about a lot, and that is um, this story that I mentioned briefly in my talk a few weeks ago on the German government's feed and tariff program. And then I'll stop and open up a Q&A. Um, so this is an amazing story. The tool, so the, what happened was German government policymakers realized that there was a climate crisis and they needed to find a way to think about then driving down the price of and producing decarbonized human activity. There was not a huge, there was some demand, but there wasn't a huge demand for this yet in Germany. Okay, but it was there, but it's not huge. And they thought, well, how do we design a policy tool that might actually um, change preferences and change behavior? So they created the world's first feed and tariff program. And essentially what it did is that it went to the calibration side and it said, we're gonna offer long-term contracts, not subsidies, um, but contracts with homeowners in place, with homeowners who place solar panels on their rooftops, 20 year contracts. It'll be a subsidy, but it'll be in the form of a contract, which immediately locks in future governments because you've got to pay then compensation costs if you actually break a contract. For the subsidy, doesn't have that kind of problem by itself. Uh, so homeowners did this, and then, uh, but they also said at the setting side, any excess electricity you produce, um, we're going to pay you at the retail rate, not the wholesale rate. And this encouraged all kinds of behaviors on the part of Germans to be very low carbon, putting on jackets and so on, and making money at the same time. What did this do? This then produced, just like private health care insurance in the United States, this produced demand uh, that then led to companies filling this demand with solar panels. Well, what happened was it expanded over time. More and more Germans who didn't get this initially wanted this program. It diffused within Germany, and then more and more demand emerges. And then also the norm emerges that you are not being a good citizen if you don't have solar panels on your rooftop. It shifts from an economic logic to a normative preference, okay? And then this then leads to um, uh, uh, feasibility calculations changing over time, such that um, now Germans are demanding this and support it strongly, okay? They change feasibility. And now, uh, such a positive and interesting uh, story about policy design, but it's diffused despite no global convention to over 160 countries all over the world, right? So it, it acted the way consistent with those four key features. So that all is a way of saying, therefore, that path dependency analysis can unyield really important designs that then could have plausible logics for making a difference in the world, uh, where the evidence, though, that then emerges 15 years later, it's too late to collect to an experimentalist approach or initiative which would have actually been almost reinforcing a tautological short-term approach to what is actually, uh, we need a long-term orientation. Uh, so that's why we also need to think about then path dependency and historical and qualitative work when we look at and encourage collaborative research using different knowledge sources to achieve problems. And I'll stop. Thank you so much, Ben. And hopefully, can everyone online hear me a little bit better now? I've got a microphone over here. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much, Ben, both for sharing all of those thoughts and also for your efforts to leave us a little bit of time. Also for the q and I know we could have talked about this for a lot longer, um, but let's work with the time we have. Um, in fact, do we, ha do we have questions that have already come in from online. online? Why don't we start with that? Because those people right. won't get an opportunity later. Yeah, so let's begin course. with that. Hi, Ben. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I have lots of questions rolling around my brain. Um, so the question comes from um, online. It says, I'm interested in Ben's comments about the Harvard climate cluster and the criticism that their hire suggests they are focusing on analysing the problem rather than solutions for the climate crisis. I'm wondering what recommendations, Ben, you would have um, for how to foster an innovative focus on solutions and what is the kind of training that needs to be provided for students and researchers? Yeah, great question. And I do have that answer in other slides. So I look forward to uh, our further conversations 
on that, let me just say briefly, I think it's a really important question. We'll be discussing it a bit later on today in, in the workshop too. Um, so the first thing I think everybody has to ask is, what methods uh, does my discipline that I'm trained in uh, uh, deploy and why do they deploy them? Okay, so let's take the discipline of economics, um, which is very sophisticated in um, both um, doing willingness to pay surveys and then also finding a way to move forward uh, through a uh, cost benefit analysis to predict then certain outcomes that are the most rational. Uh, this involves sophisticated quantitative uh, skill sets uh, that are incredibly impressive and difficult to, uh, um, to muster uh, without just doing that your whole life, okay? And it's so challenging. And the economists get into the details and they're really good at it, okay? But it reinforces a certain worldview about the world that I would argue undermines the climate crisis or makes it actually um, uh, solving it um, limited to those things that are consistent with an economically optimal outcome. Uh, so if you're hiring on a climate cluster, you're looking to economics and that kind of quantitative method they apply as the primacy and the most rigorous way to proceed, then it will undermine an ability to solve the problem based on what I just talked about. But if you then said, uh, no, we want to go in line with the nature of the problem itself, 1.5 degrees Celsius, how can you economists help us? Then the answer is we can help you design policy tools achieving, not avoiding these problems, okay? But that conversation is not happening. It's instead, it's that the, the most economists are adding that whether we can address the climate crisis is whether we can find a rational, economically rational answer to our sophisticated quantitative methods. And not asking the question, how can I help you achieve 1.5 degree solution? So Nordhaus wins a Nobel prize in this stuff, says the most rational answer is 3.2 degrees Celsius. But the climate, the climate scientist tell us, tell us the answer is 1.5, okay? So it's destructive without thinking about other knowledge sources that come in. But most of the hires and most of the people out there doing the analysis for climate change are advocating for uh, an approach that reinforces an, econ an economist ontology. And that's where the destruction lies, not the actual contribution itself. Contribution itself is very important, just as misdirected right now. So we need all kinds of methods. The question is how do we then think about not being um, shackled by the disciplines we are trained in if we're gonna solve these problems. And that requires a great degree of conversations that unfortunately we're not really even now having to date in the way we need, in the way we need to. That's a short answer to a very important uh, question. Thank you so much, both for the question and, and also for the response. Those of you who are online, please feel free to keep typing the questions into the chat and we'll try to come back to some more. But perhaps we could switch across now to those who are in the room. Yep, okay, and we've already got one up the back. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Ben. It's a super interesting presentation. Um, I, I'm interested, and, and maybe I just haven't quite gotten it all, but I was interested in your idea of path dependency and kind of picking solutions that are um, irreversible because I, you know, thinking about like that example of the um, QWERTY keyboard and there are, there are plenty of others where you often can't tell now what problems might arise from the solution you've come up with because the world is a very complicated place. So um, in, in this kind of set of diagnostic questions, is there a way or a mechanism that stops you locking in things that seemed like a good idea, but turned out not to be. Do you yeah. see what I'm getting at? No, I love the question. Thank it's you. actually why I'm here right now in Melbourne to get the answer from you guys about this problem. <laughs> so I started writing this chapter for a book on this very question, right? So I'm coming, uh, I'm, we're making, I'm making explicit what was kind of implicit in our analysis. We meant locking in the objectives, the very clear objectives. We didn't mean locking in bad technologies and so on, right? But most of the literature, like since our article, which is I guess now 15, 16 years ago, um, a lot of literature is now being applying path dependency analysis, decarbonization pathways and so on. But they suffer from this very problem. If they're thinking more about like a one pathway uh, where everything just gets decarbonized. But what if you choose a pathway where you get to four degrees Celsius, not 1.5 degrees Celsius? How do you know then that's a good pathway to be on? So how do you lock in the objective that does allow for adaptation in settings and calibrations when knowledge comes in that that isn't quite the right path. 
to me is the key question. And we never meant to imply otherwise in our original framework, but it's been applied that way, right? So it requires much more sophisticated thinking about than policy design to allow for that, right? And that's why I started on this notion of thermostatic, either institutions or thermostatic policies. Thank you very much. Do we have more questions come through the chat? Okay, so we can take another one in the room. We, we, is anyone anyone over there? Okay, let's go with you. Yep. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm wondering whether you discuss these these um, issues and and you know ways of thinking with policymakers and what their responses are. Yeah. Um, uh, so. Uh, there's a number of ways to handle that question. Um, uh, so I work in different contexts where policymakers are involved in some way. Uh, I happen to be in sabbatical um, at the University of Ottawa's Smart Prosperity Institute a few years ago. And we literally had, literally had workshops with the government of Alberta, uh, which is a high carbon province, on how they could use this to find a way to think about creating path dependency, and they were quite keen on understanding more how that would actually work. Um, but did we then, were, the, were, the, were we then engaged like the economists were and then, you know, multi-year efforts to then help them do this? No, we weren't at that level, right? But at the level of, for example, applying this kind of framework to thinking about um, how to improve indigenous rice resources in Peru that would also improve climate benefits, we got significant funding from GIZ and other, and other governmental agencies to actually really foster this kind, of, um, this kind of effort. And I would say, finally, we're, you know, uh, you know the broader initiative I'm involved now in Singapore and um, on an environmental initiative, uh, government seems quite keen now to look for a different and broader ways to think beyond a purely economic uh, lens. So I think, I think it's promising now as more and more people get um, um, recognize that this issue is, is uh, getting at such great stakes. Um, they want to try other, other possibilities, but I wouldn't want to be Pollyannish, you know, and it's, and it's a lot harder to explain this than it is to say cost benefit answer is this, right? But I think it's catching. Thank you. Okay. I think we've got time for one more question and response. Have we got any more coming through online? We've got one online. Okay. We've got one in the room. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I was interested in that sleeper solutions idea that you identified that there are you know, these potentially hidden things that yeah. actually make yeah. a big difference. But yeah. How do you identify those beforehand? I mean, yeah. government's inclination is, you know, yeah. pretty crude levers around ban it, you know, fine it yeah. or, or subsidise or promote it somehow, promote change. And, yeah. But where to... How do we get to the sleepers that might actually make a difference? Okay, thank you. I love your question. So I'll give you an example, and it's a forestry climate example. So a few years ago, I have a student, master student, comes to my office, she's Canadian, and this is important for the story. And, and she says, you know, you and Oz need to talk, and Oz is also Canadian, and I'm Canadian. We're all at Yale, right? She's, I said, yeah, but Oz, he's a biologist, and we get, they don't really talk a lot to each other. And, and she said, well, you really should. And I want you to advise me in a project uh, where we're gonna apply your frames together to understand better how to address the Canadian boreal climate challenge, okay? So part of the boreal climate issue, it turns out, is that when mining and logging intervened uh, into the boreal, it, it opened up um, large areas of land that were previously forested. And this caused foraging of moose, okay? The increased moose, habitat and moose then forage on leaves uh, and sticks and stuff. And all of that's led to, you're not gonna believe it, increases in carbon, okay, from eating the leaves. No, this is from a real scientist, my colleague Oz, right? And so um, what do you do? And now you've got a punctuated uh, uh, increase in carbon emissions owing to these efforts that are also path dependent in many ways, right? So we thought about it and we, we sat down for almost, uh, seven months, deliberated, thought about this framework, uh, thought about solutions, and we thought, where are the easy to pull levers? Where would you find them? And we realized the answer could be three-level bureaucrats, and more specifically, hunting licenses. 
It turns out that there's a pressure plate dynamic in the broil forest uh, between uh, moose, caribou, and wolves. Okay, and right now the way they were actually hunting for uh, caribou, they're undermining this cycle and increasing um, emissions. And so by changing hunting licenses to harvest more moose, you could bring back the emissions to levels that were before uh, the hunting, before the um, mining and logging emerged, right? But of course, the hunters don't generally as a coalition don't care too much about climate change, but the environmentalists do. And this lever would create what is known as Bootleggers and Baptist coalitions, very different coalitions supporting the same intervention, which is always, which is way more sticky than when they're divided, right? So we theorized if you pulled this lever, you would create a, this kind of coalition that would then um, over a number of steps lead to and help Canada achieve its Paris Accord commitments with no legislation in, in mind and it could expand diffuse outward, right? That's one example. And we actually got published on that. Go, going back to your question, it didn't actually do it, right? But it was a great idea, right? And that we think would have made a difference. Wonderful. Okay, well, we're right on time. So thank you. That, that okay. worked out well. Thank you very much again to Ben for taking the time to be here and share all these insights uh, to everyone here in the room um, and online. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting time to be having this conversation, right? Particularly after the weekend, perhaps yeah. it will turn out to have been a critical juncture. You know, perhaps the, the parameters around political feasibility and willingness to pay and so on will turn out not to be as fixed as they've seen, yeah. seemed to be for the past decade. So really interesting time to engage with these ideas. Thank you again. Um, perhaps we should a round of applause for, for Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much.